Good morning, everyone. Yes. Hope you can uh, hope you can hear me all right. Yeah. Good. 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 It's uh, Steph is not here today. She's um, she's got an optician's appointment, and um, uh, so apparently she was waiting ages for an optician's appointment. She was telling me about this last week, and then they eventually offered her one on Sunday. On the Sunday, she said, "I can't do a Sunday." And she said, and they said, oh, we'll give you another one. And she said, I bet it's going to be on a Wednesday morning. And you know what? It turned out to be 11 o'clock on a Wednesday morning. So um, there we go. It's always the way, isn't it? So, but she said she had to go for that one. Um, does anyone have any nice news to share with us this morning? Well, that's always, that's always good news to remember. Always like to give thanks for, definitely. Um, I mentioned last week that um, the, um, the diocese have put our, our house on the market and um, yesterday um, we had 15 lots of people coming to look at the house. Um, it was a big, there was a stream of people coming in and out every 15 minutes from about half past nine till about um, quarter past two, uh, half past two. So that was a bit stressful yesterday. Um, so we'll find out in a, in a week or two whether you know, we we're able to, um, uh, like I think I said to you, didn't I, that we were hoping to, we had made an offer on the house, you know, we want to stay there. Yeah. But uh, we'll find out in a week or two whether, you know, whether, how that's all gone. So, um, just to, oh, thank you very much. Yes, I do appreciate that. And um, it's one of those times, isn't it, where you know, you know things are in God's hands, but, you know, you have to put your money where your mouth is, don't you? That's the thing. It's, it's, very, it's very easy to say, I know things are in God's hands when everything is all secure and you're fine. But saying, you know, I know it's in God's hands when it's not very secure, that's actually a lot more difficult. Um, but nonetheless, actually, um, you know, for me, I found a lot of um, refuge in, uh, as I often say, in the Psalms and in, you know, what's... Um, you see in the Psalms of trusting in the Lord. And Psalm 25, which is where we got to today, is a very good psalm of, of that. That's actually the psalm which we looked at in the Thought for the Week, if you saw that last week. Um, page 556. Page 556. Psalm 25 on page 556 and um, we'll read we'll read this all together so Psalm 25 page 556 and let's say this all together in you Lord my God I put my trust I trust in you do not let me be put to shame nor let my enemies triumph over me no one whose hope in you will ever be put to shame, but shame will come on those who are treacherous without cause. Show me your ways, Lord. Teach me your paths. Guide me in your truth and teach me. For you, my God, my Savior, and my hope is in you all day long. Remember, Lord, your great mercy and love. For they are from of old. Do not remember the sins of my youth and my rebellious ways. According to your love, remember me. For you, Lord, are good. Good and upright is the Lord. Therefore he instructs sinners in his ways. He guides the humble in what is right and teaches them his way. All the ways of the Lord are loving and faithful toward those who keep the demands of his covenant. For the sake of your name, Lord, forgive my iniquity, though it is great. Who then are those who fear the Lord? He will instruct them in the ways they should choose. They will spend their days in prosperity, and their descendants will inherit the land. The Lord confides in those who fear him. He makes his covenant known to them. My eyes are ever on the Lord, for only he will release my feet from the snare. 
Turn to me and be gracious to me, for I am lonely and afflicted. Relieve the troubles of my heart and free me from my anguish. Look on my affliction and my distress and take away all my sins. See how numerous are my enemies and how fiercely they hate me. Guard my life and rescue me. Do not let me be put to shame, for I take refuge in you. May integrity and uprightness protect me, because my hope, Lord, is in you. Deliver Israel, O God, from all their troubles. Amen. It's a great psalm, isn't it? And uh, I think that the verse which I often um, think about, which often just comes back to me, is verse 3. No one who hopes in you will ever be put to shame. And um, I think that's, that's the truth, isn't it? You know, that through all our lives, wherever God leads us, that at the end of the day, no one whose hope is in him, where we're trusting in him, where we're following his leading, will ever be put to shame. And, and that's something which I hope that we can all testify to. That as we trust in God, that he leads us and um, that at the end of the day, he's, you know, he guides us and makes sure that, you know, the right thing happens in the end. Um, well, we're going to have a couple of songs as we start, a couple of shorter songs. Uh, and the first song is uh, number 549, The Steadfast Love of the Lord Never Ceases. <coughs> And this is uh, based on those words from the middle of, uh, middle of Lamentations. And uh, yes, even in the middle of, of lament, when the, the Israelites had been taken off into exile, they were still able to proclaim the faithfulness of the Lord, saying that his love is steadfast, uh, which is absolutely true. And let's, uh, so let's uh, sing this um, two shorter songs to, uh, this morning, 549, The Steadfast Love of the Lord. Let's stand to sing. see the faithful love of the Lord day by day making this new. Thank you. 
to be in the new creation. We pray that you'd help us to look forward to that in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Well, do please be seated. And uh, if you take up your service sheets and we'll pray together. together the prayer of preparation on the uh, opening page. Almighty God, to whom all hearts are open, all desires known, and from whom no secrets are hidden, cleanse the thoughts of our hearts by the inspiration of your Holy Spirit, that we may perfectly love you and worthily magnify your holy name. Through Christ our Lord. Amen. And this summary of the law, um, which actually we're going to be thinking about a little bit in the, uh, in the sermon this morning. This is what Jesus said. The first commandment is this. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is the only Lord. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, and with all your strength. The second is this. Love your neighbour as yourself. There is no other commandment greater than these. On these two commandments hang all the law and the prophets. Amen. Amen. Lord, Lord have mercy. And a prayer for the Queen and for the government. Almighty God, the fountain of all goodness, bless our sovereign lady, Queen Elizabeth, and all who are in authority under her, that they may order all things in wisdom and equity, righteousness and peace, to the honour and glory of your name and the good of your church and people. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who is alive and reigns with you in the unity of the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Amen. We're going to turn to our scripture reading today. Have we got someone to, to read? Someone? Jill's in the reading. Oh, Jill's in the reading. Okay, so Revelation chapter 2. Thanks very much, Jill. Did you want all of it? No, no, yeah. That's right. That's right. Yeah. That's right. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> <coughs> Reading today is uh, taken from Revelation, and it's Revelation chapter 2, verses 1 to 7. And it's uh, to the church in Ephesus. To the angel of the church in Ephesus, write, These are the words of him who holds the seven stars in his right hand and walks among the seven golden lampstands. I know your deeds, your hard work and your perseverance. I know that you cannot tolerate wicked people, that you have tested those who claim to be apostles, but are not, and have found them false. You have persevered and have endured hardships for my name and have not grown weary. 
Yet I hold this against you. You have forsaken the love you had at first. Consider how far you have fallen. Repent and do the things you did at first. If you do not repent, I will come to you and remove your lampstand from its place. But you have this in your favour. You hate the practices of the Nicolaitans, sure, which I also hate. Whoever has ears, let them hear what the Spirit says to the churches, to the one who is victorious. I will give the right to eat from the tree of life, which is in the paradise of God. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks. 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 finger in that um, on that page we'll be back there in just a moment but uh, before that we'll say together the creed in our, uh, in our service sheet I've got, I guess I've got mine in there so uh, yeah let's say the creed together we believe in one God the Father the Almighty maker of heaven and earth of all that is seen and unseen we believe in one Lord, Jesus Christ, the only Son of God, eternally begotten of the Father, God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten not made, of one being with the Father. Through him all things were made. For us and for our salvation, he came down from heaven, was incarnate from the Holy Spirit and the Virgin Mary, and was made man. For our sake he was crucified on a conscious mind. He suffered death and was buried. On the third day he rose again, in accordance with the scriptures. He ascended into heaven, and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead, and his kingdom will have no end. We believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son, who with the Father and the Son is worshipped and glorified, who has spoken through the prophets. We believe in one holy Catholic and apostolic church. We acknowledge one baptism for the forgiveness of sins. We look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. We'll do turn back to uh, Revelation chapter 2, page, or page 1, 2, 3, 4. There we go, how about that? Page 1, 2, 3, 4 in the Church Bibles. I don't know if you've seen in the, the news over the past few years, things where sort of scandals have come out in the church where uh, things were not always as they seem to be. Um, so you may have heard of, um, for example, Jonathan Fletcher, who was the vicar for many years at Emmanuel Church Wimbledon. He was well known in um, you know, church circles. He was quite an influential uh, person. Um, and it came out uh, in the newspaper a few years ago that he had for a long time he had been abusing young men and um, this had been going on and, and apparently no one had, had noticed it. Similarly um, a year or two back there was um, an evangelist called uh, Ravi Zacharias, he died um, a few years ago uh, and uh, he was a, he travelled the world you know, speaking and you know, evangelising and many people came to faith through him and yet it turns out that after he died, it all came out that, about um, abusing uh, women and about having inappropriate uh, relationships with uh, many um, different women uh, and so on. And you might rightly ask, how on earth does this happen? Yeah. Now how on earth does it happen that something on the surface can appear to be going well and can appear to be good, and yet if you look behind what's happening, there is real 
evil lurking and real problems. How does that happen? And I think that this passage, this letter in Revelation is a really important letter for us to be thinking about as a church because it, it speaks, I think, into this kind of situation and says, you know, it helps us perhaps to have a, a bit of a spiritual checkup and to say, are we doing ourselves what is, what is right? You know, are the conditions in our lives, in our church, healthy? And that's what this letter is, is about. But just let's just put this into context before we look at the actual letter, because this is it's written to a church in Ephesus, in a particular church. And um, Ephesus is mentioned elsewhere in the Bible. You may know if you've read uh, Acts, you know in Acts chapter um, 19, then they talk about um, Artemis of the Ephesians. Uh, the temple of Artemis was one of the seven wonders of the ancient world, and it's in Ephesus. But I think, do you remember a couple of years ago, two or three years, I think we looked, did Discipleship Explored as a Lent course. And do you remember the videos? I think they went to Ephesus and they looked at the ruins of this temple. You can still go and see it. It's in Turkey, in modern day Turkey. And, um, and so there was a, you know, the, the, the Artemis temple was a massive thing for Ephesus. And Paul comes along preaching the gospel and there's a riot in the city because they are taking too many people away from Artemis. Um, so the early Christian church knew what it meant to have opposition. They knew what it meant to face persecution. And, and that's the context of Ephesus. And um, this letter, Revelation, as far as we know, is probably written around, we think, about 19 AD. So maybe about 40 years after after Ephesus was first. So this is a church that's about 40 years old uh, at this point. So let's look at what the letter actually actually says. Uh, it's, it starts out, as all of the letters start out, to the angel of the church in Ephesus. Um, every letter has the same kind of opening formula. I don't know why it says to the angel. It, it might mean, it, an angel can mean a messenger. That's just what the word means, it means a messenger. Um, or it could be, it could be the, the leader of the church, you know, the, the, um, the pastor. Um, I think that the idea is, it seems to me, that uh, it, it, it's just this idea of it being to, to all of us. You know, that this is actually a message which is not just for this particular church at that time, but is actually for all of us to listen in on. And this is a, this is a message which is to all churches. And um, every opening statement, it starts like it kind of draws on this vision. If you remember last week, we were looking at that amazing vision of Jesus Christ. And it says, these are the words of him who holds the seven stars in his right hand and walks among the seven golden lampstands. Remember, we looked at that wonderful vision of Jesus last week. And every, every, uh, every letter starts with something connecting with Christ. So what does he say to them? Uh, well, he, uh, he, he commends the church. Uh, he says, I know your deeds. It's interesting, actually, he says that, isn't it? He doesn't say, I know your faith. He says, I know your deeds. And he says, um, they seem to be doing it uh, pretty well. You know, so they're working hard for God. He says, I know your hard work and your perseverance. They are doing lots of things for the Lord. Um, they are striving for purity. You know, they want to stick to the message of the Bible and they want to stick to the, the right way of living. So he says, um, I know that you cannot tolerate wicked people and that you've tested those who claim to be apostles but are not and have found them false. So they are, uh, they're sticking to the message of the Bible, they're sticking to the message of the apostles and they, they don't tolerate wicked people. They don't tolerate people who turn away from, uh, from God's ways and they're commended for that. Um, and they persevere in suffering. It says there in verse 3, you persevered and have endured hardships for my name and have not grown weary. So they've kept going despite the persecution which they are, they are suffering. And as we, as we heard at the beginning, they must have been in, in Ephesus encountering some quite serious opposition from this Artemis um, cult. 
in Ephesus. So, so they knew what it was to suffer for the Lord, and, and they're commended for that. They, they're working hard, they're striving for purity, they are enduring suffering. In other words, if God wanted to advertise what it meant to be a church, you know, God was producing a brochure saying, this is what the church should be like. He'd want to put Ephesus on the front cover, wouldn't he? You know, look at Ephesus. You know, they're working hard. They're, they're pure. They want to be pure doctrinally. They are, um, they're enduring hardship and persecution. What a church. You know, imagine, look, they're doing so well. And yet, and yet, they come in for criticism. Verse 4, yet I hold this against you. You have forsaken the love you had at first. Consider how far you have fallen. They lost their first love. And Jesus says, consider how far you've fallen. He says, all of that stuff that you're doing, the work, the, the perseverance, the purity, all of that stuff, you've, it, it's a terrible thing to fall away from love. Now, why is that so significant? Why is that such a significant thing uh, that Jesus says? Well, that's because life uh, should be all about love. That is literally the one thing that God wants us to do. You think about the, the greatest commandments that we had just at the start of the service. Think about what Jesus says. What are the greatest commandments? To love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind and strength. The second one is to love your neighbour as yourself. So Jesus himself says those are the two greatest commandments. They are love is, is, is what God wants us to do. Again, Paul, uh, the Apostle Paul in Romans, he says in Romans chapter 13 verse 10, love does no harm to a neighbour. Therefore, love is the fulfilment of the law. Love is the fulfilment of the law. So we are to love others. That's, we fulfil the law not by, if you like, a black and white obedience to the letter of the law, but the, obeying the law of love which stands behind it. So you think, for example, of, of do not murder. Yes, we shouldn't murder anyone, but what does that mean about how we should treat them instead? And this is what, this is the point, isn't it? That we need to love people, not simply just avoid doing bad things to them. And uh, finally, the, the, um, Paul says the famous passage in 1 Corinthians chapter 13, we looked at this as a church a few months ago, uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 13. If I speak in the tongues of men or of angels, but do not have love, I am only a resounding gong or a clanging cymbal. If I have the gift of prophecy and can fathom all mysteries and all knowledge, and if I have a faith that can move mountains but do not have love, I am nothing. If I give all I possess to the poor and give over my body to hardship that I may boast, but do not have love, I gain nothing. So Paul says that you can be as spiritual as you like, do as many things as you like uh, for God, but if you're doing it without love, it's all in vain. That actually, love is the key. And it's very, it's possible, we learn from this passage, it's possible to be doing a lot of things seemingly for God, a lot of spiritual things, but not actually have love in your heart. And that is actually a very serious uh, problem. That's not a good place to be. And this is why Jesus says, Back in uh, Revelation chapter 2, he says, uh, Repent and do the things you did at first. If you do not repent, I will come to you and remove your lampstand from its place. Now that's a serious thing. He says, Repent, turn away from that. He says, Repent of doing those spiritual things, but doing them without love. Turn back to the love that you had at first. So otherwise, I'll take away your lampstand. Then you know, you, you're going to stop being a church. If you don't start actually acting in love, you're going to stop being a church. 
you're not going to, there's not going to be a beer church in Ephesus anymore. And that's a very serious thing, isn't it? Um, but he says, there is a, a message of um, encouragement there in verse 6 again, but you have this in your favour. You hate the practices of the Nicolaitans, or Nicolaitans, I'm, I'm not sure either how you pronounce that, which I also hate. There, there's no record of the Nicolaitans. Uh, it may be a symbolic thing. Um, it may be presumably some group who were just trying to draw the Ephesians away from God, perhaps, or trying to infiltrate the church. Um, looking at other letters, that may be the case. So they wanted to stay pure, they wanted to stay close to God, uh, but they didn't have love, that was their problem. And so um, the letter finishes, whoever has ears, let them hear what the Spirit says to the churches. Just another clue there, that this is not just a letter for Ephesus, but this is a letter for everyone. Now it was to Ephesus, but it's for, for us all to listen in on and to learn from. And um, I like that it says what the Spirit says. You know, we've got the, the Father speaking, we've got Jesus speaking, we've got the Spirit speaking. You know, it's, it's, it's kind of like when God speaks, they speak together and are all involved in this process. And um, the concluding, concluding bit, he says, to the one who's victorious. So to the one who's, this often finishes to the one who's victorious. Just the one who persists, to the one who carries on with God, despite everything. I will give the right, even from the tree of life, which is in the paradise of God. And this is looking ahead to the end of the book. Looking ahead to the chapter 21, which is the, the image of the new creation, the, the new Jerusalem. And he's saying that those who are victorious will be there in the new creation and will eat from the tree of life. And that the paradise of God is really thinking about the Garden of Eden. And that's what God is restoring and God is bringing us into. He's bringing us back, if you like, into the world as it should be. Into that perfect world with the tree of life and, and so on. That's what the imagery is. So as we, we come to the end of this uh, of this passage. Let's just uh, take a moment to think about how this applies to us, or just some questions really for us to think about. I think the main message of, of this that really struck me is that orthodoxy, you know, being biblical, reading the Bible, praying, doing lots of things, everything, it, it means nothing without love. It means nothing without love. So how do we measure up to that as individuals? I think it's very easy to get into the, the habit of doing stuff for God, but not doing it out of love. Uh, I don't know if, if you've um, experienced this or, or come across this. There was um, someone in my, um, uh, in my dad's church uh, a few years ago who left the church because they were on the, they sort of looked after the kitchen and, um, you know, the teas and coffees and things. And someone wanted to come in and, and change, you know, help out. And they said, no, no, I'm not having this. And they left because they couldn't do the kitchen their way, basically. And you think, did someone really want to serve out of love or had the kitchen become their own little empire, which they just wanted to... Now, it's very easy for that to happen. And that's what happens when we start serving without love. It's because we're not doing things because we want to love God and we want to love others, but because we want our little empire, because our service, if you like, becomes our sense of self-worth and everything gets put onto what we do. There was a very good book um, called Serving Without Sinking by John Hindley. Serving Without Sinking which I can recommend if you want a book about serving God in the church. I think, it's, I think it really picks up on a lot of this kind of thing. If he starts to serve God reluctantly, then maybe you think, well, God, you owe me. You know, you're lucky to have me. That's, I think, a good sign that we are serving without love. And so we need to, to be thinking, you know, why are we doing what we are doing? Are we doing things out of love, or are we doing them because... You know, that's how we find our sense of self-worth or, or whatever it might be. We want our own little empire. 
very easy to do. So we need to, we need to, to think about that. And I think we need to be praying that God would give us love. Now we mustn't take for granted love. But I think actually I've come to realise that love, although it's, it is a natural human thing, I think love is actually one of the hardest things, isn't it, to do, to really love. And you know, we need to be constantly coming back and praying and asking God to give us that love, love for him, love for others, to help us live in his ways. And the second thing is, thinking about love as a, as a church, is love what we are known for as a church. Because it's really struck me, and particularly lately, that the world is really starved of love. There's very little of it out in the world. And I think particularly a lot of younger people are just growing up without, in, in many broken families, they've never really known what it means to be part of a loving family. And, and do they experience that when they come into the church? Is that what we as a church are known for? This is what it says um, in 1 John chapter 4, verse 7. John, the, um, who also wrote Revelation, in fact, but um, the letter of 1 John is very much about love. This is what it says in 1 John 4, verse 7, and I'll, I'll finish with this. Dear friends, let us love one another, for love comes from God. Everyone who loves has been born of God and knows God. I think that's a good challenge to finish with. Now we love when we're born of God, when we know God. So when we know him better, we should be loving more. And so that's something I think for us as a church to, to think about and to pray about and to, to aim for. To be praying that we will be a church that's known for love. And that's known for, uh, for loving one another. And so why don't we do that now and ask God to, uh, to help us. Heavenly Father, we pray that you would help us as a church not to be um, doing things, doing lots of things for you, um, persevering and putting on lots of events and all sorts of things, Lord, but doing it without love. We do thank you, Lord, for the love in our church and pray that you would help our love to grow, that you would help us to, uh, to serve you out of a heart of love for you and for others. And that love would be something that people really experience when they come here. And uh, would really know in our, all, all our relationships. So we pray that you would help us and transform us uh, to be people who grow in our love for you. And our love for one another and for the world we pray. In Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Well, we're going to um, turn and, and continue in prayers, and uh, Mary is going to, uh, to lead us in our prayers. And I'd just like to say, uh, I'm sorry, Mary, that you were down to pray last week. And due to the... Uh, due to the... Uh, due, but this is a reminder that if anyone would like to, to read or to pray, then the, um, the sheet is there to, to sign up, and uh, you're very welcome to at any time. So thanks very much, Mary.
I pray, Lord, for all the nations, and I just wish and pray, Lord, for my heart and soul, that they would learn to love one another and help one another. Those terrible things have been going on, Lord. But please, Lord, speak to them, Lord, let them open their hearts to you. For, Lord, you made this world so beautiful, but it's not the way that you made it, Lord. Every day on the news, it's such sad things happening. But thank you, God, for this, your church, and Lord, that we can come to worship and praise you. Thank you, Lord, for a wonderful church family, St. Mark's and St. John's. Thank you, God, that you're always with us. Thank you, God, for loving and caring for us each day. Thank you, God, for those that do whatever they do to keep the church going and preaching your precious holy word to us and the beautiful music and all the other things as well. And thank you, Lord, for yesterday, our stew day. It was great. And for those that didn't come, you missed something. It was absolutely wonderful. And thank you, Lord. God, I just say from my own heart and my soul, your love abides in my heart and my brothers and sisters. Your peace abides in my soul and my brothers and sisters. Thank you, God, for our family, our friends, and our church family. And thank you, Lord, for our neighbours. I just pray and I read this from my heart that the world will get better. But Lord, we are waiting for you on that great and wonderful day when our blessed Saviour and Redeemer, our blessed Messiah to come, the day of the Armageddon. And Lord, I know that I am waiting for you and I know that all my brothers and sisters are too. Just bless each and every one of us and give us traveling mercies home, Lord. And thank you for this morning and your holy presence here. Amen. Thank you, Mary. Well, we're going to sing um, as we uh, come to communion, and it's number 780, uh, 780 in the, uh, the hymn books, How Deep the Father's Love for Us. And I think sometimes, you know, we can um, we think about, you know, how do we how do we get that kind of love which we've been thinking about, or how do we maintain it? And I think one way that we, uh, one very important way that 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 love is is worked in us is as we keep looking at God's love, and particularly when we remember um, the death of Jesus for us. <coughs> And how much God loved us in sending Jesus to die. That although we were guilty, vile and helpless, as it says, that Jesus died for us. That while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. We know how much God loved us. And that gives us that love back for him and for others as well. Number 780, how deep the Father's love for us.
can take up your, uh, your service sheets and where it says the confession will join in in uh, just a moment. So brothers and sisters in Christ, as we gather at the Lord's table, we must recall the promises and warnings given to us in the scriptures. Let us therefore examine ourselves and repent of our sins. Let us give thanks to God for his redemption of the world through his Son, Jesus Christ. And as we remember Christ's death for us and receive this pledge of his love, let us resolve to serve him in holiness and righteousness all the days of our life. You then, who truly and earnestly repent of your sins, and are in love and charity with your neighbours, and intend to lead a new life following the commandments of God, and walking from this day forward in his holy ways, draw near with faith, and take this holy sacrament to your comfort, and make your humble confession to Almighty God. Almighty God, Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, Maker of all things, Judge of all people, we acknowledge and lament our many sins and the wickedness we have committed time after time, word and deed, against your divine majesty. We have provoked your righteous anger and your indignation against us. We earnestly repent and are deeply sorry for these our wrongdoings. The memory of them weighs us down. The burden of them is too great for us to bear. Have mercy upon us. Have mercy upon us, most merciful Father. For your Son, our Lord Jesus Christ's sake, forgive us all that is past, and grant that from this time forward we may always serve and please you in newness of life, to the honour and glory of your name, through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. We were thinking a little bit about 1 John um, today, and uh, 1 John also says that if anyone claims to be without sin, they deceive themselves, and the truth is not in them. But if anyone confesses their sins, then the Lord is faithful and just, and will forgive us our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Almighty God, our Heavenly Father, who in His great mercy has promised forgiveness of sins to all those who with heartfelt repentance and true faith turn to him. Have mercy on you, pardon and deliver you from all your sins, confirm and strengthen you in all goodness, and bring you to everlasting life. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen. Hear the words of comfort our Saviour Christ says to all who truly turn to him. Come to me, all who labour and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. God so loved the world, that he gave his only begotten Son, that whoever believes in him should not perish, but have eternal life. Hear what St Paul says. This saying is true and worthy of full acceptance, that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners. Hear what St John says. If anyone sins, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous, and he is the propitiation for our sins. Lift up your hearts. We lift, we lift them, them to the Lord. Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It, it is God right to give thanks and praise. It is indeed right. It is our duty and our joy at all times and in all places to give you thanks and praise, Holy Father, Heavenly King, Almighty and Eternal God. Therefore, with angels and archangels and with all the company of heaven, we proclaim your great and glorious name forever praising you and saying, Holy, holy, holy Lord, God of power and might, heaven and earth are full of your glory, Hosanna in the highest. And we pray together, we do not presume to come to this your table, merciful Lord, trusting in our own righteousness, but in your manifold and great mercies. We are not worthy so much as to gather up the crumbs under your table, but you are the same Lord, whose nature is always to have mercy. Grant us, therefore, gracious Lord, so to eat the flesh of your dear Son, Jesus Christ, and to drink his blood, that our sinful bodies may be made clean by his body, and our souls washed with 
through his most precious blood, and that we may evermore dwell in him, and he in us. Amen. Almighty God, our Heavenly Father, who in your tender mercy gave your only Son, our Saviour Jesus Christ, to suffer death upon the cross for our redemption, who made there, by his one oblation of himself once offered, a full, perfect and sufficient sacrifice, oblation and satisfaction for the sins of the whole world. He instituted and in his holy gospel commanded us to continue a perpetual memory of his precious death until he comes again. Hear us, merciful Father, we humbly pray and grant that we, receiving these gifts of your creation, this bread and this wine, according to your Son, our Saviour Jesus Christ's holy institution, in remembrance of his death and passion, may be partakers of his most blessed body and blood, who, in the same act that he was betrayed, took bread and gave you thanks. He broke it and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take, eat, this is my body which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, after supper, he took the cup, and when he had given thanks, he gave it to them, saying, Drink this, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant, which is shed for you and for many, for the forgiveness of sins. Do this as often as you drink it, in remembrance of me. Amen. Amen. And just to say, I will uh, come round and bring the bread round first of all. Do take and eat that as I give it to you, Amen. and then I'll bring round the... Uh, the uh, individual cups for communion and do hold on to that till the end and we'll drink all together. Drink this in remembrance that Christ's blood was shed for you, and be thankful. Amen. 
And let's pray together as the Lord Jesus taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from the evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. We pray together on the uh, prayer after communion on the back page. Lord and Heavenly Father, we offer you through your dear Son, Jesus Christ, this our sacrifice of praise and thanksgiving. Grant that by his merits and death, and through faith in his blood, we and all your church may receive forgiveness of our sins and all other benefits of his passion. And here we offer and present to you, O Lord, ourselves, our souls, and our bodies, to be a reasonable, holy, and living sacrifice. Fill us all who share in this holy communion with your grace and heavenly blessing. Although we are not worthy through our manifold sins to offer you any sacrifice, yet we pray that you will accept us, the duty and service that we are. Do not weigh our merits, but pardon our offences, through Jesus Christ our Lord, by whom and with whom and in whom, in the unity of the Holy Spirit, all honour and glory be yours. Almighty Father, for ever and ever. Amen. And just as we, uh, we come to the end, um, one or two, uh, two notices. Um, so next week, it is the uh, first Wednesday winter warmer. It's a special theme service called the Bread of Life. And uh, it says uh, soup and rolls will be served for lunch after, afterwards. So, um, it'd be good to just get a, a little idea of numbers. Um, I, I assume that um, most people here will be planning to come next week. I should... yeah? yeah. Well, that's good. So that's that's a, a few anyway. Can let Steph know. But uh, um, yes, that's a good thing to invite people to, and um, it's something we haven't been able to do for um, we couldn't do that last year, obviously. So it's um, nice that we're able to do that again. And um, yeah, there are some invites to that on the table at the back. Um, this afternoon, it's the craft group. The craft group is back, um, and that's four o'clock this afternoon. I'm not sure what they're making this afternoon, um, but um, that will be four o'clock here. So if you're interested in doing some crafty things, whatever that might be, that's later on. Um, I think that's all, apart from the obviously the regular things in the, in the new sheet. Um, birthdays? Well, we have to, we have to see how Is anyone else this week? So it's just Jill. Well, I'm sorry, Jill, but we're going to have to sing happy birthday to you. It's, it's the rules. It's the rules. Da, 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 da. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday, dear Jill. Happy birthday to you. There we go. Um, well, we're going to have our closing hymn now. So it's number 72. Number 72 in the hymn books. Come, let us sing of a wonderful love. You know how um, some hymns make you think of certain people, and, and this hymn now, in my mind, is associated with um, Daphne Bruce, because um, we had this uh, hymn at her, her funeral service, um, and um, which I think is a lovely way to remember someone, you know, that um, this was one of her favourite hymns, and uh, it's a lovely one, thinking about love. Um, so let's uh, stand and sing number 72, a closing hymn.
with some closing words now from uh, the end of the book of Hebrews. Now may the God of peace, who through the blood of the eternal covenant brought back from the dead our Lord Jesus, that great shepherd of the sheep, equip you with everything good for doing his will, and may he work in us what is pleasing to him, through Jesus Christ, to whom be glory for ever and ever. Amen. 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 Go in peace to love and serve the Lord. Amen. In the name of Christ. Amen. Amen.